Okay. God damn it. Okay. We're motherfucker. <laughs> We're recording now. <laughs> yeah, okay. This is if you're watching this on YouTube, you have no fucking clue why I'm laughing. <laughs> This is Misery Loves Company, a weekly social reading series hosted by MiseryTourism.com. Uh, each week, we welcome outsider and transgressive authors and artists to read and present their work. Uh, before we get totally rolling today, so that I don't forget, um, <clears throat> just before I just before I kind of launch the Zoom chat here, Stuart. Buck over at uh, over at Bear Creek sent me a link. I guess uh, well, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I guess if you're watching this on YouTube, you might not be aware, and a few people attending might not be aware. But there's a site called the Bear Creek Gazette, and it's kind of a presents itself as sort of like a town newspaper, but it's set in a very morbid and I guess cryptid infested fictional town. A it's like if Welcome to Night Vale was good. If well, there you go. Thank you, Griffin. If Welcome to Night Vale was good. Uh yeah, you know, I've never I've never watched Welcome to Night Vale or listened. You're not missing much. Yeah. Um but it's a great publication. If you haven't checked it out, you should check it out. A lot of the authors who have written for Misery Tourism, a lot of the authors who attend these readings, have written stuff for Bear Creek. But anyway, I'm belaboring the point. There's a Kickstarter now. Um, Stu started a Kickstarter for the, a collection of, is this like the first, like, however many issues of Bear Creek? Is that what this is? I just got the link before it started. I think, Griffin, you might know a little more. Yeah, it's going to be, um, as far as I know, it's going to be like, selected uh, stories from the first three issues. So the two that are out now and the upcoming one. Um, I don't know how he's selecting them or if it's just gonna be all of them in one like tome, but. Right, right. Well, no, that, it sounds awesome. <laughs> sounds like a great project. Bear Creek is awesome. Sorry, uh, Stu, I'm so sorry if I didn't give it do the Kickstarter justice here, but I put the link in the chat and if you go on Twitter, you can find that we've retweeted the link on Twitter. So it's actually doing pretty good. It's already, I think, raised close to $400 and I just launched. So if that's something you think you might be interested in, go and check it out. Okay, <laughs> now, um, um, <laughs> now anyway, let's get started with the reading. Sorry guys, I know uh, we're running a little late, but first, uh, Unity. Um, in Unity, you were actually going to read a piece by Blick, right? Who yes, um, right. read last week. Let me put the link in the chat here, actually. <clears throat> what do I look like to you? Don't be shy. Do you find me attractive, repulsive, scary, charming? How about determined? Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Brainerd Bullion and I am a certifiable creativity coach, a conduit to the sacred hermaphroditical muse, Sin. I reside in a Long Beach, New York rental unit that offers a partial oceanfront view. My passions include somersaulting in the nude and doing unusual things with eggs. As a devoted disciple of sin, I praxis and teach reasonable and sound enchanted thinking that invariably leads to the achievement of affirmative outcomes. Let me offer you an example of the positive power of my sacred sin praxis that occurred just last week. I was riding the F-Line subway train to Neptune Avenue when a foul-smelling young man of great height boarded the train and pushed his way to the center of the car. He wore a white baseball cap with the words, Eat the Rich, stitched in large lavender letters. As the young man cleared his throat, I expected him to either spit or begin an agonized plea for money. He did neither. 
Instead, he pulled out a pistol and ordered an attractive woman in tanzanite heels to pull the emergency stop cord. After the train pummeled to a stop, he began to rage how humans have become lactose intolerant because we stopped ingesting mother's milk and replaced it with the cow milk that has made American women look like heifers and American men look like castrated bulls. You fools! Your last glass of milk actually came from a bull, he screamed. When a trio of teenagers tried to rush him from behind, he shot the ringleader. He then punctuated each sentence of his memorized dairy manifesto by pointing his gun at a different rider and yelling, pow, cow. While transit riders cowered and many wept, I remained calm and silently invoked the healing power of sin. Much to my surprise, these words leapt from my throat. Coughing milk through your nose is one of the seven cleansing rituals of dairy yoga. Milkshakes are the gift from heaven that come in different flavors. Life happens, honey. What are you gonna do? Cry into a bowl of milk? Upon hearing this, the gunman shot himself. They called me a hero, responsible for saving many lives on that train. But it wasn't me. What saved us was Sin's oral response to my silent, desperate plea for guidance. My mouth was just used as its vehicle of protection. There are many creative consultants who live to milk the bank accounts of the anxious and insecure. Not me. I live to share this sacred praxis of sin with you. I, Brainerd Bullion of Long Beach, specialize in the reclamation of frustrated, disillusioned, humiliated, and blocked artists suffering within all branches of the humanities. My postgraduate work in the fields of scatology and sanitation are the perfect precursors for, for my present avocation as a creative consultant to aesthetic satisfaction and artistic fulfillment. My consultations are done exclusively through house calls because creativity must engender movement and momentum in order to succeed. Skeptics have accused me of using house calls to avoid office overhead while living off the pipe dreams of others. I abhor pipe dreams. I make a virtuous living as a pipe fitter. I install, assemble, fabricate, maintain, and repair artistic ambitions by helping artists secure airtight connections to their creative process and products. I work with an array of national and international nonprofit and commercial art networks. To begin with, I never submit an artist's work. To submit means to be judged unfavorably as a possible non-equal. Submission is the acceptance of creative surrender. An artist must never submit to any authority except to that of sin. I offer up a client's work to prospective dealers, curators, producers, and publishers in the same spirit one offers up a gift as an enticement for pleasure, prosperity, and affable enlightenment. I first came to understand the unique powers of sin's gift of individualized creativity when I was a young child who still believed in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. A sin-inspired epiphany occurred one Christmas Eve while I was playing a wise man in our church's annual Christmas pageant. While in bearded costume, bowing and presenting a gift to the baby Jesus in the manger, tears suddenly spilled down my face, and I wept so loudly Pastor Weber had to pull me off stage. After the church service ended, I was brought to the sacristy and given cookies and cocoa, while the pastor, my parents, and the Sunday school teachers who supervised the pageant tried to calm me and discover why I was so upset. In between sobs, I told them I could no longer believe a wise man could ever be joyous over Jesus' birth, and that anyone who says Merry Christmas, throws parties, decorates trees, strings lights, and exchanges gifts, all in celebration of this infant, must be a cruel liar. Why is everyone so jubilant to see this baby born? Just three months later comes Easter, and this baby is a grown man who is mocked, betrayed, tortured, and murdered in a most excruciatingly sadistic manner that ends with his broken body tossed into a stranger's grave. Ho, ho, ho! Instead of acknowledging my precocious Yuletide insight into raw truth, they became upset and told me it all had to do with sin. My sin. And then I was slapped into a decade of psychotherapy. But, unbeknownst to my parents, one of my shrinks practiced Reiki therapy, which means spiritually guided life force energy. Reiki involves the passing of energy from a trained Reiki practitioner's body to the client's body as a method of healing. This Reiki practitioner used a series of established hand positions as a means for allowing energy to move freely between her body and mine. That's when Sin first formally introduced themselves to me. 
and I learned how most people corrupted sin's name because of their fear of visionary thinking, and so chose to misspell it and interpret it as sin in order to obliterate its healing, mystical properties of unique contemplative thought always turning into affirmative action. I'm currently working with a client who is a prolific and accomplished fine arts photographer. Not too many years ago, she was a widely exhibited and published winner of multiple NEA artist grants, as well as a recipient of highly competitive residencies at both Yado and McDowell artist colonies. However, for more than a decade, her work has been completely ignored and she's become dangerously despondent. When we met, she presented me with a shocking proposal. My client is a purist who refuses to succumb to digital photography and give up the excitement of her dark room discoveries. However, film and chemicals are just too expensive and spatially she can't afford the extra room in which to develop her photographs. Her last two agents dropped her when they insisted she needed to create art videos based on her images in order to revive her photographic career. She abhors video art claiming they're mostly repetitive, appropriated images, and soundtrack sends the fingerprints of a personal humanity. Her proposition was for me to help her complete her first and final art video that will chronicle the soul-crushing loss of her artistic voice. She engaged me to help her conceptual conceptualize and create the world's first artistic suicide snuff film, a final ironic protest against the cruel indignity of her cultural neglect. She was determined to kill herself on camera in a most powerfully imagined, imagined, imaginative manner. Her expectation was that her video would be her swan song that would fly into international galleries and museums, thus avenging her neglected and rejected late period artist's life. Upon hearing her goal, some may call me crass as I always accept checks and credit cards, but I amended this policy and insisted she pay me cash up front. I thought her project cutting edge and I immediately came up with a conceptual title for her terminal performance video, Sentenced to Death by the Muse. She loved it, but a few days later, my conscience got the better of me, as well as fear of the legal implications of assisting a suicide. When I tried to talk her out of filming her suicide and change course for her first and final art video, she was defiantly adamant that the reason for her taking such a drastic, innovational, lethal action was the lost echo of my uniquely artistic voice. Hmm, the loss of her artistic voice. She claimed not being able to avoid print photography supplies, a dark room and the total lack of art world attention to her work, the loss of her artistic voice. That kind of thinking is irrational and is most certainly not to die for. Thanks to the intervention of sin, I was able to explain to her the scientific conceit developed by physicists that sound waves never disappear. Sound waves spread out and get weaker and weaker until they are, until they just about disappear. And that's when they transform into thermal energy units that are, that are eternal. According to this highly respected theory, we are surrounded by the voices of every word that's ever been spoken by both the living and the dead, but we can't hear them because the ultimate sensitive listening device has yet to be invented. Thankfully, after much debate, she finally accepted my proposition. Using this concept, I sketched out a new video called Babel, On and Off White, to be shot within Brooklyn's Greenwood Cemetery's kinetic landscape of funereal monuments and sculptural ossuary patinas. The goal of this new artwork is to have the viewer experience what I call a seduction from the graveyard dead, who are excited and impatient to recruit mortals into their powerful and extremely vocal eternal community choir. This terminal seduction will be achieved by inducing a kind of video viewer trance rooted in an escalating aural and visual cemetery cacophony. This rising dissonance approximates an ethereal heart attack by allowing her viewers to pass over into the world of the dead when the jarring crescendo of flashing funereal sculptural images and the humming, hissing, screeching garble of overlapping voices abruptly ends when the screen is suddenly filled with a silent blazing white. There are dead in this art video, but in my updated version, thank Finn, it isn't the artist herself. We were recently notified that Babel on and off white has been shortlisted as a finalist for the prestigious and lucrative Alfred B. Sloan Foundation grant awarded to artists who seek to build bridges between the two cultures of science and the humanities in order to develop a common language to better understand and speak to one another. So, how may I be of service to you? That was so funny. <laughs> that, for, as usual, Unity, your delivery was spectacular. But that, 
I'm really like coming to love Blick's voice, like that knack for that like exuberant, unreliable narrator, like who's always trying to pitch you something, always trying to sell you something. Like this narrator and the narrator to his piece last week, the bed bugs piece, like there's this same like goo line of like this kind of like pathological salesmanship to them that I fucking really dig. And, and yet it's two like fantastically different characters, but I don't know, just wonderful, hilarious piece. Thank you for reading it, Unity. And Blick, you're in the audience, so thank you for writing it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Blick, for letting me read your work. Um, oh, uh, Don. Hey, you did a wonderful job. Thank you so much. I want to. I want him to read it because I'd like him to do. A, <clears throat> I'm getting together with a <clears throat> videographer friend of mine. I want him to do a, a performance video. So this is the first time I've ever heard it read out loud. It's the first time uh, Unity's ever read it. And thank you so much, Judy. That was that was great. I love your energy. Thank you. Got a, okay. I've got a quick question. Just, um, I should totally know this, but I'm curious if anyone has an answer. That that style of talking, you know, every, the chat was kind of blowing up like, oh, it sounds like old time radio. And I was saying like, that sounds like the narrator of like a old noir flick. Like, Transatlantic. What, what happened to that? Like, where did that style of speaking come from? Like, was it, was it influenced by radio and movies or like what I guess what happened first the chicken or the egg does anyone have an answer to that I don't know if other people uh have any context but you know with the transatlantic accent that they all had they were all taught that in in schools okay I, that's what you call the transatlantic accent right that's yeah and I, okay. don't, I don't know what what how, why it was developed whether it was developed to uh avoid like something being too anglo versus american I don't know but that yeah it was taught in the schools that they all the actors would have gone to and, okay Versus being, yeah, so which is actually kind of interesting because I, I was like, uh, why do people no longer talk that way? Um, but yeah. Well, that's really cool. That's really fascinating. Yeah, I, I've never even thought about that before. Like, it, you're right. Like, there's this kind of very, like, specific voice. And, and like you, Gabriel, I was just sort of it as like the old time radio voice or something. I had no right, idea right. what name for it. Well, you know, um, I'm basically a playwright. And so I, I, what you just said, just, I was like, a uh, hundred years, I never thought of what, that was a, a, great, a great question you just asked. I just think of a character and I just riff along to, to how I imagine that character would speak. But now you brought that up, now you got me fucking wondering, you know? No, it's per it's it worked know. perfect with that piece. I'm just yeah, every every time I hear that voice, I, I always wonder and I always forget to research it or look it up. But yeah, I should I should know that by now. I should know it. I wrote it. I have no clue. <laughs> Jared, I just was trying to figure out a way to say all the words in the I don't, you know, <laughs> like, your, your, your pronunciation is insane, man. I was so impressed with that. It's unbelievable. I can't believe, yeah, it was like silk. And you've never read that before, right? That, this is like basically, that's a cold, it's, it's a cold reading. I'm, I'm, I don't know how, I don't know how you did that. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm blown away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Unity. I, I never heard that. I've never heard that piece. Yeah, that was amazing. Um, up next is Donald Matheson, and now uh, Unity. Donald's a friend of yours, I think. Do you want yeah, to give him a little bit of an introduction? Don. Or? Yes, Don. So Don Matheson is uh, a new friend of mine. He came into the shop that I worked in a couple of weeks ago, and he and he asked me to tell him a story, and we kind of hit it off, and we've been telling each other stories about our lives back and forth. Don is a veteran radio broadcaster. He's had really an extraordinary life and career. He's uh, met and interacted with every US president since Lyndon Johnson. Um, and he, I was, he, he was generous enough to give me a copy of his memoir, A Broadcaster's Life. Um, and I read the first chapter and I just, I found it absolutely riveting, harrowing, um, yeah, so that's what he's going to read as far as I know. Wow, that's right. awesome. Hey, Don, so the Hello. stage is yours. Okay. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is uh, 
Unity, I can't top your performance. <laughs> you did an outstanding job. So um, as Unity said, uh, we met at a coffee shop and um, I often ask people, give me your best story. And um, Unity was uh, on my radio show. We talked about his life. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the first chapter of A Broadcaster's Life, a book I wrote about myself, my career, really. I didn't get into my personal life. I worked hard on the first chapter, but the rest of it, I was under a really tight deadline. I wasn't, wanted to give the book away to all my friends and family when I hit 70. I only had three months. Then I realized I had to send it out to the, pub, the, the printer, and that's going to take a month. So I banged out the rest really fast. But the first chapter is decent. It's called An Eyewitness to Epic Destruction. It started like any other day at that point in my life, walked eight blocks of congested Brooklyn streets to catch the end train, change at 59th Street to the R to Rector Street in the financial district. I followed a routine of three flights of subway stairs to the street at the intersection of Greenwich Avenue and Rector. Quick glance two blocks north to the peak, to take a peek at Two World Trade Center, visible through the narrow canyon, strolled past Trinity Church Cemetery, always looking at the Robert Fulton Monument and Alexander Hamilton's tombstone. Being a history buff, I'm mindful of the role Fulton played in helping launch the steam-powered transportation revolution and Hamilton creating a market for federal debt, all part of the epic saga of Lower Manhattan. Crossed Broadway onto Wall Street, walked through the side entrance of the New York Stock Exchange, up one flight of stairs to my broadcast booth, overlooking the exchange's trading floor. I booted up my PC, snapped on my Bloomberg terminal, and started to read in, checking overseas markets, scanning for stories that might move equities up or down. This was all part of my routine as the clock raced toward 9.30, the opening bell. Damn, the phone rang. That was never good because I didn't have time to chat. I was preparing for 64 radio broadcasts ranging from one to five minutes long, crammed into eight hours of constant deadlines. The assignment editor was on the line calling from Bloomberg's Midtown headquarters. There were lots of disadvantages of being, of being isolated from the newsroom. It was easy to be forgotten, taken for granted, and sidelined on a big story. The advantage was I was left alone to do my job away from the office madhouse filled with aggressive, ambitious, and mostly younger journalists gunning for my airtime. In print, it's all about getting ink. In broadcasting, being on the air is the co coin of the realm. <clears throat> Excuse me. The editor told me there was a fire at the World Trade Center and I was to get over there immediately and find out what was happening. I was just a short walk away. He had no details. I protested saying, I had deadlines. The editor said that I'd get someone else to cover until I got back to my booth. My first thought, I'm getting too long in the tooth to cover fires. I did that for decades. I'm an inside the studio guy now. But an order is an order, so I stepped out, a little used doorway at Wall and Broad Streets near the Buttonwood tree that the NYSE keeps as a homage to its founding before the American Revolution. I immediately knew something awful had happened. I didn't know what, but I sensed something disastrous had occurred. Thousands of sheets of paper, business documents were fluttering in the air. There were dead pigeons lying in the street. My ears were filled with the sounds of sirens. Back in the day, as a street reporter, I covered lots of catastrophes. Accidents, calamities, and tragedies were nothing new to me. I had even been at the scene of the World Trade Center bombing on February 26, 1993. I remembered it well. It happened late on a Friday afternoon. It was a cold, rainy day with clouds hanging low in the sky. I was doing a television stand-up in City Hall's rotunda. My thoughts at the time were focused on a weekend away from the petty politics of city government. But the old marble facade of the City Hall building built in 1803 shook as I recited my lines. And I did the unthinkable. I uttered, what the fuck was that? Into the camera. Luckily, it wasn't live. I was recording a segment for later broadcast. A cop, the plainclothes detective who stood sentry at the main entrance to City Hall, said there was an explosion at the World Trade Center a few blocks to the southwest. I ran all the way. It was a hell of a story. Six people dead, including a pregnant woman who 
coincidentally lived in my Bay Ridge, Brooklyn neighborhood. I reported live from the scene. This is what I said. The streets around the World Trade Center are jam-packed with hundreds, literally hundreds of emergency vehicles. I've never seen so many fire trucks, police cars, EMS, and ambulances from out of town as far away as Long Island and New Jersey. In another broadcast, I reported this. Over 150 people were taken to downtown Beekman Hospital. That's the main center where victims are being treated. Most of those injured are relatively minor. People are suffering from smoke inhalation and exhaustion. Many had to walk from the 109th, and in some cases, the 110th floor, all the way to the ground. And they had to do so under adverse conditions, heavy smoke and no lights in the stairwell. I pushed those memories aside. That was then, this was now. I had a new story to cover, no time to get lost in the past. I didn't know it yet, but my life was about to change forever. Shortly after I arrived on the scene, I saw the upper stories of One World Trade Center burning. Then there was a loud crack, an enormous fireball as the second plane crashed into Two World Trade Center. I didn't see the second plane. From my vantage point, I was viewing the north and east face of Two World Trade and the south and the east face of One World Trade. The plane that crashed into Two World Trade approached from the west, turned sharply, and flew into the tower from the south. My first thought was, how the hell did flames jump from the north tower to the south tower, causing such an enormous explosion? I quickly dismissed that possibility and then wondered if there was some problem with air traffic control misdirecting planes. But the skies were clear as a cool glass of spring water, a rarity in New York. No clouds, no visibility problems, then I considered the idea that terrorists were firing rockets from the New Jersey shoreline or from a boat in the Hudson River. No one I spoke to on the ground had answers. <clears throat> I did on the scene reports. One of them included me saying, saying something I deeply regret, something that haunts me to this day. I was very close to Two World Trade. I was reporting what I was seeing and hearing at that tower. I was some distance from One World Trade with no firsthand knowledge of what was happening there. Jessica Edinger Gottesman and John Tucker were the studio anchors. Tucker kept asking me about the fate of the people in One World Trade, and I kept saying, I didn't know. He persisted. I blurted out, they're probably all dead. Many were, including Tucker's brother, who worked on the 104th floor. He left behind a wife, two young children, siblings, and parents. My friend John has never spoken to me again. I ran for my life as the South Tower fell. I was just a few hundred feet away, standing in a crowd of people, many of whom had escaped from the building. Now we were all running for our lives, burning debris falling all around us. The smoke and dust was washing over us in waves, getting thicker and thicker. A woman tumbled to the ground in the mad rush to escape. A man helped her as she kicked off her high heels. Now she was running barefoot on the pavement, thick with soot, busted glass, and soon her blood. The woman got cuts on her feet, but kept running. Sprinting east on Liberty Street, south on Broadway, east again on Wall Street, the crowd was directed into a basement by custodians who worked at a building called to Wall Street, an office tower that now provided temporary safety to the panicked herd. The building has five subcellars. The custodians ushered the fleeing people first into the lowest level, at that basement level filled with refugees from the developing disaster. Custodians then began directing survivors up to the next level. I was parked on the third subcellar, about 30 feet below the street. At that point, I took out my cassette tape machine and microphone and began recording interviews with people who had escaped from Two World Trade. Robert DiMatteo was on an upper floor of Two World Trade Center when the first plane struck. Here's what he said to me. I felt a bad shudder on the whole building. I stepped out of my office and I heard one of the traders on the trading floor yell that a plane had hit One World Trade. 
So immediately everyone started to evacuate the building. We just went straight for the stairs. We walked down the stairs and got to the lobby on the street level. Now here's a transcript from my on the scene radio broadcasts. I saw the impact of the second plane hitting the South Tower. While I was looking up, it was a loud bang. It was an ear splitting crack followed by a fireball coming out of the north face of the building. There was a great deal of smoke and debris falling. People started to run, screaming and shrieking. A few people fell on the street. No one was trampled as folks helped them get up. Then history was altered. Here's what I said. I saw the South Tower collapse. There was a rumble and a banging, a pancaking noise. The top of the tower started to lean toward the Northeast. There was so much debris and dust flying around. I was in a large group of people. At first we thought we were safe, but it quickly became apparent that we were not. Almost 3,000 people died that day, most of them killed in the Twin Towers. On the streets surrounding the World Trade Center, survivors and bystanders were fearful, but for the most part, they remained in control. More of what I reported on the radio. Let me tell you what the scene is like now in Lower Manhattan. The air is thick. It's almost, it almost appears like very fine volcanic ash. It's as much as four inches deep on the street. I have a wet handkerchief over my face. It's surreal. It feels like the aftermath of a battle. Dead birds and body parts in the street. I knew I had just escaped serious injury, possibly even death. I was concerned for myself, my children, and my wife, but I was driven by instinct as a reporter to get as much of the story as possible. I was back on the air about an hour later, and here's what I reported. From the Hudson River on the west, to the Battery on the south, to Nassau Street on the east, I was not able to go north, there was almost complete devastation. I saw active fires burning in a large office building directly south, of where the World Trade Center once stood. And I say that deliberately because the World Trade Center does not exist anymore. There's a major fire burning in the Gateway Plaza apartment complex. Three quarters of the Winter Garden appear to have been destroyed. The Marriott Hotel, I spoke to a man who works there. He said he ran out of the lobby when the ceiling collapsed. I tried to hold back describing victims who were blown to bits I had reported on dead people in the past, vehicle wrecks and shootings, but on 9-11, I struggled to find words to explain what I witnessed. Here's what I said next. I was walking to the west on Rector Street, a few blocks south of Two World Trade. I came across a wheel from a plane. It's a big tire and it was attached to part of the landing gear. It was thrown up against the side of a building. It had damaged the building. Without elaborating, there were body parts littering the street. Then, then I did something that I lament, and it's haunted me ever since. There were perhaps a hundred rags covered with dust on Rector Street. I had no idea what I was looking at. And here's what I did. I kicked one of the rags with my right foot. I wanted to see what it was. To my horror, it was a piece of a leg from the knee to the ankle. The rags were clothing, covering pieces of people, people who had been in the planes. I know it's not rational, but I can't forgive myself for having kicked that body part. Then I went on to describe the damage. There are fire trucks smashed to smithereens, police cars totally destroyed, city buses, taxi cabs, private cars, trucks, all kinds of vehicles destroyed. And there were many people in these vehicles. The streetscape was unrecognizable. The pavement looked like there had been a snowfall. The dust is a whitish gray color. The air is like breathing in ammonia from a wash bucket. There's another incident. It still torments me. This one occurred while the towers were still standing. I came upon a New York City Fire Department captain with a group of firefighters getting ready to go into the South Tower which was then a raging inferno. I asked the captain if he had ever seen anything like this. He spit out his words, obviously not. 
The firefighters under his command looked nervous. The captain raised his hand as he led his men into the building. Not one of them came out alive. 343 New York City firefighters died that day. I had just spoken to a dead man walking. I got away alive. I'm grateful for that. Nightmares came that first night, interrupting my sleep in a Park Avenue hotel because I was unable to get back to my Brooklyn home that night. Thankfully, the nightmares eventually faded away. One night, I woke up screaming after a particularly frightening dream in which my dead father appeared. He told me to get my family and myself out of the city because more disasters were coming. I shook it off. It's just a bad dream. I wasn't leaving the city. But I had breathed in toxins pulverized glass, concrete, and asbestos. Over the following years, cancer developed in internal organs. My vocal cords, seriously damaged by the poisonous air, would eventually fail and needed to be surgically repaired. I've had five hospitalizations for cancer and throat problems, including three surgeries. Now, years later, I remain bitter towards those bastards responsible for what we call 9-11. They ripped the heart out of my city, which I love so dearly. They destroyed countless lives. They forced numerous changes in my country, including invasive security measures and seemingly endless cycles of overseas wars. I make no apologies for wishing that the terrorists responsible for the attack on and destruction of the World Trade Center I say, rotten hell for all eternity. That was riveting. That was absolutely riveting. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for reading. I can't imagine what it must have been like to be in New York City on that day. Like, <laughs> it's funny because, um, you know, I, I was... I was in I was in high school then, and and everyone from my generation, you ask them where were you on 9/11, and they can tell you. But it's always some like some mundane little thing, and that stuck vividly in your mind. I can't even I cannot even begin to imagine what it must have been like to experience that day, the way you experienced it, and, and the way that you you've laid it out here is just incredibly moving and incredibly riveting. Thank you so much for reading. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Don. I really appreciate you coming out to read that. And it was twice as harrowing as it was when I read it. I knew as soon as I read it, I got chills. And I thought it was just, you did a beautiful job telling the story in words and you read it beautifully. And if you can look at the chat, um, you could scroll up and see all of people's comments, how, how, how much it, um, how much they responded to that. So thank you. Oh. Roll up to where Derek made it. I didn't read it as good as you did realize that. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I already said it. Scroll up to to Derek Main saying, I'm always saying this, and you could start to see people realizing where it was going. Yeah, I'm very grateful to have to have heard that. Yeah, that was incredible. Don, thank you so much for reading. Yeah, you're all welcome. I'm glad it's 20 years ago now, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I imagine. And I mean, I think one thing that that chapter captured that I hadn't even thought about before is how like the, the small, like the smallest decisions are the things that you like remember later that like, that you regret later, like the just the decision to like, kick what you thought was a piece of fabric, like how that has stuck with you and what you said to a friend of yours, like you think about like the large scale, like the, the immense like horror of the tragedy and you don't think so much about like the small choices you make in a moment of terror that like stick with you for so long after, so. Yeah, I remember those little things more vividly than I remember the building falling down. Don, alone, it, can, can I ask you something? This is something, when it happened, I'm a, I'm a Vietnam veteran and I, I was just a, a target, not a warrior. And my, body, my, my, my job was tossing body bags into planes in the Air Force. And what I smelled that day, because my girlfriend lived on Franklin Street, you know, about 
mm -hmm. six, five, six yeah, months. Yeah, I know away. where it is. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> the thing that got me was retroactively, it was like 28 years later, I smelled the dead. You smelled it. It was it was a smell most people didn't associate, but it was it, but it was an, an act that 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 acrid smell, and I tried to tell people that were there that's what it was. That's what it was, and people were just no nobody was nobody was believing was believing that you could actually smell these the, the these dead humans. So you were right there. You were you you were right there too. I I didn't get there till like the six o'clock because they wouldn't let the people who were out. Um, come down past the south of Canal Street. The, uh, mm -hmm. the cops wouldn't until around six o'clock. Uh, but it just, uh, it, 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 I, I just want, because everybody else, everybody else said I was crazy because they, they never smelled it. It was so pungent, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Pungent is a good word for it, yeah. I mean, yeah. If, if you never smelled it before, you wouldn't know what it was, but you obviously have and okay just uh, people were saying i was crazy back then but okay thank you yeah thank you blick and thank you don and thank you yeah thank you so much for sharing that uh next up uh mike mike uh excuse me michael mcsweeney you're up next cool um uh, now you're going to be reading uh is this another like dream story or you no, this is this was just an idea I had. I've been playing a lot of Dungeons and Dragons recently, um, and so I I had this idea for a story yesterday. Um, sorry, before I start, Don, that was incredible. Thank you for sharing that. Um, but yeah, so I just shared um, shared a document in the chat here. Um, I wrote this today slash this morning, so I scrubbed it a little bit before the event. It's probably gonna be a little rough around the edges. I was trying to be cool and not use quotation marks for the dialogue, so I'm just going to be confusing myself with it. Um, but yeah, so let's see, <laughs> let's see how it goes. Um, cool, it's called Saving Throws. We managed to find a cab to May and Rich's place, even though the world is going to end. Despite what's about to happen, our Dungeons and Dragons group decided in the text thread that it shouldn't get in the way of the weekly session. Jen and I go outside, and it takes 20 minutes or so until we spot a cab. A small miracle. The driver chews an unlit cigar and doesn't look at us as we clamber inside, and the cab yelps forward on the pavement, rushes down the street, and passes beneath successive red lights without stopping. I look over at Jen as they read headlines on their phone. I read the words, Saturn flung from orbit on the screen. Don't read that shit, I say. I put my hand over the screen. Sorry, they say. You don't need to apologize, just don't waste your time. I guess. Jen puts their hand, smaller and thinner than mine, on top of mine and squeezes. Some of the screen's light peeks through our fingers and illuminates the sweatbands on Jen's face. Hey, can you pull up, pull over one block up? We need to stop for something, I say to the driver. The driver grunts. The windows in the car are down and the cool air rushes inside. A light haze hugs a sky bronze from the city lights. My eye settles on one of the few visible stars. After a few moments, the star vanishes, a twitch of dim light to nothing. Hey, I say, turning to Jen. Here is good, the driver asks. He points at the windshield with a thick index finger. I recognize the intersection, a block or two from the apartment. Yes, this is fine, thank you, I say. The cab grinds to a stop beside the curb, and Jen and I both lurch forward, but we catch ourselves on the seats in front of us. Jen's glasses fall from their face, and I watch them grope in the dark at their feet. How much do I owe you? I ask the driver. Nothing. You sure? What good is money? So why take fares tonight? The driver shrugs. Something to do, he says. We get out of the cab and watch it jump into motion, twist around a corner, disappear, I wonder where the driver will go next, what he's thinking, if he plans to stop. Maybe that's just the way of things. Life keeps steering until the wheels fly off. I wanted to stop at this point because normally we visit this great wine shop on the corner here, but now it's dark, empty. The front window burst open like a pulverized mouth. Shards like broken teeth bloomed on the sidewalk and inside. 
I crunch across the glass and find three unbroken bottles of Cabernet on the floor, some shitty brand I don't recognize. Now it's not the time to be snobby, I think. I hear a rush of air behind me and turn around. Jen has the phone in their hand again and they're looking up. I step back through the front window and raise my head just as a helicopter buzzes past, landing skids almost touching the top of the trees. It's unsteady motion like a fucked up wasp, too angry to, to fly straight. Jen raises their phone to take a picture before the chopper jerks around the side of a tenement building and out of sight. Maybe someone is going for a joyride, Jen says. Maybe, I say. At Rich and May's apartment building, we find the front door held open by a metal folding chair. The doors of many of the mailboxes in the lobby are open, and at the center of the room are scraps of cardboard and packing tape. Packages ripped apart, their contents hauled away. There's a dry quiet, the kind you become uneasy thinking about its origin, enough so that we grow suspicious of the elevator and decide to take the stairs. Five flights up, slow steps, my face flush and body heavy from the climb. We haven't left our own place much in the past week, so the exercise is more grueling than it should be. Nights bound to the gravity of our phones, disorganized versions of a directional truth more staggering with each refresh of the digital stream. This morning I dropped mine from our balcony and watched it splinter like concrete. A small, clean sound and a momentary stab of quiet between police sirens on the street and the interstate thunders. Jen said I was crazy for doing it. I said I was tired of knowing the time. I knock when we reach the apartment door. May, our dungeon master, answers. Her long curly hair falls on her shoulders like sea waves at night. We kick our shoes off in the entryway and pad across the hardwood floor into the living room. Rich grins at us, his feet flushed as he carries a circular table from the kitchen. We help gather the chairs and place them around the table before assuming our usual places. Rich fetches some wine glasses from the kitchen and sets one down in front of each of us while May unties the opening of a purple cloth bag and pours out a colorful splash of plastic dice, 20-sided, 8-sided, 6-sided, everything we'll need. She unfolds a, a cardboard barrier. The picture on the barrier depicts an enormous horned beast charging at a group of heroes, a Tarrasque, the greatest enemy in the game. What's the plan for tonight, I ask May. That's up to you, she says. That quest to clear out an orc cave he got at the end of the last session is one option. Rich pours himself a glass from one of the Cabernet bottles. I want to do something crazy, he says, for our last game. Don't, May says. Come on, it's not. Not again. I asked you before. Rich smirks. Orc cavern it is. Fuck, I say, realizing that we forgot our player's handbook back at the apartment. It doesn't matter, May says. The comment feels like a pinch before she clears her throat and continues. It doesn't matter because we have extras. The, cat, the tavern is packed with people, May says, swigging grog, playing dice, arm wrestling, the classic activities of a Saturday night. The three of you are sitting at your usual table. What do you do next? I'm going to stand up and take out my sword, says Rich. Okay. Then I'm going to walk up to the biggest guy in the bar and attack him. I look up from my character sheet. Rich's eyes are on May. Jen has their phone in their lap and is typing something and doesn't seem to have heard what was said. Do I need to roll to attack? Rich asks. No, says May. He's just a local rando in a busy tavern. You hit from behind. Roll for damage. Rich takes a 10-sided die and rolls it. It lands on a zero, meaning 10. That's 14 with my modifiers. 14 damage, he says. Okay, says May. The guy dies. Everything stop, and everyone else who is at the table stands up. Two city guardsmen who are in the tavern approach you and take out their swords. Now you roll for initiative. Rich rolls his 20-sided die. 19, he says. Should we also roll? I ask. If you want to get involved in the fight, says May. She rolls some dice behind the barrier. You go first, she says to Rich. Rich rolls his 20-sided die. 15. That's a hit. Nine damage. Okay. We hear May scratching a number down with a pencil. Now the guardsmen, they all miss. You go. 16 to hit, says Rich. Roll damage. Six damage. The guard dies, says May. More dice rolling behind May's barrier. They all miss, she says. Okay, next guard, says Rich. He rolls again. 19, he says. Close that time. You know it's a hit, says May. Five damage. May writes, May writes it down. She rolls the dice. 
Two critical hits, she says. What? Asks Rich. Two critical hits from both guards, so let me roll damage, says May. 22 damage total. Shit, says Rich. He looks at me. Jamie, can you heal me? I start to speak. I'm not... You'll get drawn into the fight if you heal him, says May. You need to help me, says Rich. You're the cleric. I laugh. You picked this fight, not me, I say. Rich's eyes flash from his dice to me, and all I see is basalt, something flash-cooled, something that makes me afraid in a vague way like a dull, persistent ache in the chest, and then they are back on his dice again. Please, Jamie, he says. I laughed again, more forcefully now. What do you think, Jen? I ask. It's your funeral, Jen says. I thought we were going to fight orcs in the morning. This was supposed to be the usual tavern bullshit. Okay, I cast Cure Wounds on Rich as a second level spell, I say. I take two eight-sided dice and roll them. 13 points of healing plus two for my bonus, I tell Rich. He nods and jots something down on his character sheet. Now roll initiative, says May. I roll my 20-sided die. Five, I tell her. You're last then, she says. Jen? Uh, sure, they say. Jen rolls their 20-sided die. 14. You go before Jamie, says May. Whose turn is it now? Rich asks. May smirks and rolls some dice behind the barrier. The two other guardsmen who just entered the bar get to go. You've got to be kidding me, says Rich. You started this. Fine. One of them hits you. Why me? Because they know you started the fight, says May. She rolls a damaged die and it bounces off the cardboard barrier. Ten damage, she tells Rich. Jesus Christ, he says. You're targeting me. I'm not. You are. What about the other guards? They all missed. Good. It's your turn, Jen. Jen plays a sorcerer. They flip their character sheet and peer at the tiny, tiny scribblings on the backside, their list of spells. Um, Jen says. Do something big, says Rich. We can't just vaporize a bunch of people in the tavern. Why not, asks Rich. Because, because we're not that kind of group, if you say so. I'm going to cast Fog Cloud, says Jen. They smile at me in a 20-foot radius around us, so we can get the hell away. Okay, says May. You cast fog cloud and this huge eruption of fog fills the place. It's hard to see and you hear people crashing into tables, glass shattering, people shouting. Combat is suspended. Cool, let's get out into the street. I'm going to swing my sword at the nearest person I see, says Rich. May taps the eraser of her pencil against the table. A soft tap, tap, tap. Why, she asks. Because I want to. You don't know who you'll attack. I swing my sword. Ooh. Roll your d20. Rich rolls his die. A one. That's five with my modifier, he says. You rolled a one, says May. It's a five. I see a one. Roll for damage. Rich scoffs and flings his ten-sided die forward on the table. Nine damage. Okay. Okay. Your sword slices into Jen's sorcerer and deals nine damage. What the fuck? Jen cries out, her tone a mix of amusement and bafflement. It was your fog, says Rich. It was a dumb idea. I was trying to get us out of here. Can we still run? I ask May. Jen needs to roll to see if their concentration is broken. Bullshit, Jen laughs. They roll their 20-sided die across the table and claps when it lands on a 16. Hell yeah. The fog remains, says May. Let's get the fuck out of here, I say. Fine, says Rich. Okay, says May. I should make you roll some checks, maybe a dexterity so you don't trip over a goddamn table. But for the sake of moving on, let's say you all make it. You're in the street now. Fog pours from the windows of the tavern. There's lots of screaming and confusion, and the people who happen to be in the street at this hour are gathering in a crowd. What do you do now? I swing my sword at the, ne the nearest person, says Rich. Dude, I say, what the fuck? What? This, this isn't even fun anymore. It's just a game, Jamie. You really want to do this? May asks. Yes, says Rich. Okay, give me an attack roll. Rich rolls his 20-sided die. 15 to hit, he says. Okay, says May. She rolls a die behind the barrier. Now I need you to roll a dexterity save. Why? asks Rich. Because the person you attacked is doing something in response. Rich rolls his die again. 12, he says. May rolls a few more dice. Okay. As you swing your sword, the guy pulls a blade out from beneath his cloak and deflects your attack. He then lands three separate blows with a curved elvish blade. 
you take 29 damage. What? 29 damage. Rich stares at his character sheet. That drops me below zero, he says. You fall unconscious. That's bullshit. It was a fair dice roll. Bullshit. Rich slumps back in his chair, then sits up, takes his wine glass and drains the rest of it. He looks at me. Can you revive me? He asks. I can try. May straightens her body in her chair. A group of guards emerges from around the corner and runs toward the tavern, she says. They point at the three of you and shout that you need to stop. They draw their weapons, swords and bows. We should grab Rich and run, I say to Jen. Sorry, I seem to be missing some of my story here. Uh, let me uh, it. It's linked in the chat. Yeah, I, no, can... I, got, I, got, I got it right in front of me, sorry. Okay. Uh, very odd uh, printing situation there. Okay. Da -da, sorry about that. Okay. We should grab Rich and run, I say to Jen. You need to roll a strength check and carry him, May says. I have a higher strength rating, I say. I roll my 20-sided die. I roll a three. You struggle to lift him off the ground. She rolls some dice. Three arrows hit the ground near you, but miss. Maybe we should just run, Jen says. And leave me, Rich asks. Well, fuck, dude. You're the one who went all psycho Grand Theft Auto 3 here, says Jen. Try rolling strength, Rich says to Jen. Fine. Jen rolls her die. It lands on a seven. My strength score sucks, so I got an eight. They look at May. Not high enough, says May. More dice rolling. One of the arrows hits you and does three damage, she continues, after rolling another die. Rich, you need to roll some death saving throws while all of this is happening, says May. Rich rolls his 20-sided die. It lands on a three. He rolls again and gets a six. Two failures, says May. Fucking hell, he says. We were supposed to fight orcs, dude, says Jed. Let's just... Could we like start over from the top? I ask, laughing. Not entirely sure what's funny about the situation beyond the absurdity, Rich's fantasy bloodlust, the flat expression on May's face as she watches Rich shift angrily from behind the cardboard barrier. No, says May. What are you going to do? I look at Jen. I guess we run, I say. Okay, let's see some dexterity rolls. Jen and I roll our dice several times in quick succession. Made nods, nods along before stopping us. Okay, that's enough, she says. You manage to get out of the town center. You sneak down the quiet night streets until you reach the harbor. It's quiet down there, with boats tied up in the harbor. A waterfront tavern is nearby, bustling with activity. We could steal a boat, Jen suggests. Let's do it, I say. Cool, says May. You steal a boat, unfurl the sail, and let the wind carry you out onto the water. The sea is calm. Even as you get further out, just a beautiful, calm night. Rich stands, and we all look at him. I'm going for a walk, he says. I don't think that's a good idea, says May. I'll be fine. Back quick. Just a mare. I'm, I'm sorry, he says. We watch him go to the door, take a coat from the long rack, and pull it over himself. May stays at the table, doesn't turn, teases a small, a small tear in the cardboard barrier with her fingers. When Rich leaves, the door behind him closes with a, with a dull thud. I'm sorry about that, May says. We, well, you know. Yeah, I say, not really knowing why I said it. Then I ask if I should grab another bottle from the kitchen. Sure, says May, they're all on the counter. I stand and go into the kitchen. It's a narrow room with a small refrigerator and a gas stove. A window with no curtain looks out into an alley flooded by a darkness untouched, save for a dull rectangular glaze of light from the kitchen. The refrigerator is plastered with printed photos of May and Rich. A vacation to Seattle, a fishing trip in the Florida Keys, a wedding in Maine. In each picture, their faces are bursts of pure holy joy, wide, open mouth grins. I walk back into the room and sit down in my chair. So what do you do next, May asks. Now I'm thinking about being on a boat in the game and how long it's been since I last went to the ocean. At least since last summer, some day trip to Coney Island, two hours by train from our apartment, the smell of hot food and bodies and salt, people crisping in the beach, kites flickering in the wind. I feel a strong urge to go swimming, to immerse my body completely, to know the sensation of water and nothing else. 
I look at May and say, I'm going to jump out of the boat. May laughs. What are you talking about? Yeah, I'm going to jump out and swim. May drains her glass and reaches for the bottle. Okay, fuck it. We're swimming now. Give me a dexterity check. Okay, I say, and roll the 20-sided die. It lands on a 20. Nat fucking 20, May declares. She fills the glass near the brim and thumps the cork back into the bottle. Okay, so you jump from the boat and just start tearing through the water. Soon you're a ways away, and if you turn, the boat is just a small, dark shape. What now? I'll keep going. Okay, roll again. I roll the die again. Another 20. Fuck! Jen laughs. Rich could have used those. We all laugh now. All right, shit, you just, you just keep going and going. Jen, what are you doing meanwhile? I guess I just keep sailing, says Jen, and keep an eye out for another shore. Jen shifts in their chair and cracks their knuckles. Somewhere for a solo adventure to land, I suppose, they say before pausing, character sheet resting against the edge of the table. Do I find somewhere? They ask. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you eventually find a small town with a harbor. Not as big as Midgard, obviously, but, you know, a good-sized settlement. It turns out they don't have a resident wizard or sorcerer, so you take up residence there, helping people, befitting your lawful good alignment, of course. People there, they like you. You find a home there. May stop speaking and none of us say anything for a while. And I keep swimming, I say. May laughs. Well, you owe me a shitload of dexterity checks, so let's at least get one, she says. Okay, let's do this, I say. I take my die from the table, then turn my head toward the long window at the other end of the living room. Two large sky blue curtains are drawn across it with a sliver of a gap where the curtains meet. No one has noticed that a searing gold light now pours through the gap, strikes a glow across the floor and the table, gleams against our wine glasses. We're focused on the ocean, where it might take us. Jen is leaning back in their chair, maybe thinking of a town with no name, somewhere far a place where death isn't near. I toss my die across the table and it bounces against the base of Jen's wine glass. Another natural 20 drenched in an oriate shine. The three of us rise from our chairs and start to cheer. And that's it. Holy shit, that was awesome. And it's such a great concept. Like that's such a brilliant concept because it really, like you really get at exactly why. As someone like who has, played many a game of D&D in my life, as I'm sure you've, I've said before, like you really get at exactly the reason why people fucking play, right? Like, and at the reason why people create these, why the pe reason why people write, right? Like the tension between like the bleak, bleak reality and mortality and shit and your ability to like create a narrative, like that it, it, as like as flimsy as that might be that in some way like offers an alternative to that and it it's a <laughs> i'm gushing a little bit here but you also perfectly capture the pathological <laughs> like um personality dynamics that exist in like every fucking D, D group like i don't know how many rich moments there have been in my games or how many times like when i've been dming i've been like eh, I could just let this guy fucking die, couldn't I? <laughs> you know, and I don't know. It's a it's a it's a fantastic concept, brilliantly Thank executed. You. Thank you so much, Michael. Yeah, there's there's always someone in the group who's like one step away from just going murder rage, and it's like, well, how, do you stop them? It's like, nope, not this time. Not so, at the end of the world. Why bother? Yeah. <laughs> so no, thanks for letting me try that one out. I appreciate it. Yeah, that was fucking awesome. That was awesome, especially for. I mean, that's a first draft. That's amazing for a first draft. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, yeah, yeah, me and me, me and Rudy were just talking, like, should D&D &D have quick saving? You know, where you save the game and then you, you just go nuts and you kill everyone and then you reload? No. You <laughs> no need, consequences. As, as a D, as someone who usually DMs, <laughs> players need to live with the consequences of their actions. That's what makes it fun. Of course, the D, there's no consequences for the DM's actions. <laughs> Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so Josh, Josh is up next. Sure. So I think William, you have the link. Oh, I do. Yep. And it's, it's actually, I'm going to post another link, maybe just above whatever you do. Uh, cause Derek, uh, had actually, so this is the latest in a series of interconnected, uh, pieces of cyber writing that are going to be hyperlinked to each other. Uh, 
this is this is also a first draft something i wrote this week uh i gotta thank though gabriel uh i don't know if he's still here even uh yes he is apparently he's rushing towards the screen now i can see but uh uh he he gave a first read about i did some tweaks um to this but yeah so i it, it, these things are meant to stand alone so nobody needs to have any context of the other ones but just know it is fitting in with that the story though and what i'm discovering with trying to use this method of stories that are hyperlinked together like news stories and treating my life like a almost like that and like you know a little sentence in one of the short stories will be a hyperlink that you can click uh like they would do on bbc or something is that um i try not to do things that are too chronological um but sometimes there's no obvious place to link back. And so the only obvious place for me that wasn't forcing it is in a story that hasn't been published yet. And it's coming out in X-Ray this summer. So I have to wait for that story to come out before I try and do anything with this one, which is, um, yeah, just something I, I, I knew that kind of thing would uh, arise as I was trying to do this, pro what is turning into a project, because this will be the fourth in it. Um, but yes, so I will just start. It's called uh, Cheers, at least uh, tentatively. It's a routine beer run. Make it to the grocery store before it closes, and don't forget to grab a bag of Kraft Tex-Mex cheese shreds. You eat like a degenerate, like it's a chore, but shredded cheese saves you from complete despair. Sad scrambled eggs, one of the few things you cook, suddenly have an exotic flair. And the large vats of chili that your mom includes with her monthly care packages are elevated too. You sprinkle it on like a gourmand. Also, it's pretty good to just eat handfuls of it by yourself, to just reach into a bag full of cheese shreds and sustain yourself. Using something that most people indulge in sparingly to wholly satisfy yourself feels luxurious. It's caviar and champagne for the homeless. So yes, it's important that you make it to the store on time and you approach your task with the appropriate reverence. Ever since the pandemic began, the store has reconfigured its double-ended entrance to make it easier to monitor capacity. You can only go in one way. The other way is now an exit. As you enter, this big bald dude is approaching via the exit. A supermarket employee tries to stop him. Sir, the entrance is on the other side. The big bald dude truly does not give a fuck. He demands to be let in and keeps on going. But the thing is, you're a defender of the hourly wage worker, the ones who do without so you won't have to suffer with any less. You may work in real estate, but you haven't lost sight of what's important. You are a progressive, aren't you? So you're obviously not gonna, so, you're always, so you've obviously got to say something. And it has nothing to do with the six tall boys you've pounded back in your apartment alone on a Thursday night. You consider your words carefully before speaking. Hey, fuckhead, nobody likes this pandemic shit, but just follow the rules. Everyone's just trying to get along, bub. Recently, you read a Raymond Carver short story in which a petulant character calls someone bub and you're addicted. Like, you can't stop calling people bub. It just never gets old. For some reason though, this bub, like all the other bubs before him and all the bubs that will come after him, doesn't like it. And in classic tough guy fashion, he asks you to repeat what you just said. But you have learned with years of practice not to answer. This to you is wisdom. It is the wisdom of gazelles, of the nimble and swift. Enlightened, you pass through a second set of doors into the produce department. You used to work in grocery stores, and so you know this placement is strategic. The bouquet of vibrant colors is meant to entice the customer and to disarm them. You know better than to let your guard down, though. Instinctively, you turn around and catch Bub coming up to you. Come here, motherfucker, he says. His voice is surprisingly and terrifyingly calm. If someone yells at you, their anger is visceral. They're out of control, but they can be talked off a ledge. It shows volatility. Whereas this guy's tone is calculated, surgical, like you're an insect and he's about to pull your wings off with a set of tweezers. Run. You bolt past the cash registers, looking back before turning down an aisle. Some poor clerks have stepped in the guy's path. Essential workers, you think. You go about procuring your beer and cheese, 
grateful that frontline workers remain steadfast in their efforts during a global public health crisis. Checkout is no big deal. It's as if nothing happened. Just purchase some beer and cheese. You gather your shit and head for the exit. Soon you'll be home, heating up some frozen chili, sprinkling on a little Tex-Mex. Just a pinch. But uh, he's waiting as you pass through the first set of doors. He's waiting and he's smiling. It's the smile of a child about to maim an insect in the backyard of their suburban youth. The tweezers, motherfucker, are out. Run. By now, this seems like a routine or some strange dance, strange and uncomfortable dance, like your first dance at age 13 with that great girl whose back you made wet with your sweaty palms. Again, you run past the same row of cash registers, and again, our valued frontline workers step in. Something is different, though. Most people slash organizations slash government agencies are willing to overlook a glitch in the matrix. Things can happen once without too much scrutiny. It's why the concept of a first time offender even exists. But you've just done this twice. I have no idea what you said to him, but he's pissed, says the cashier who catches up to you in the ethnic foods aisle. You try and explain that you were you, you try and explain how you were trying to defend essential workers, but she's not hearing it. Fortunately, a more understanding colleague arrives and you can plead your case. Honestly, man, I was reaching for the hand sanitizer and he just started chasing me. The more understanding clerk explains that your assailant has been escorted out of the building, but there's a problem. He's still prowling outside the entrance. He like won't go away this compassionate soul who is at most 17 explains. So what do you do? It turns out there's a side door right near where your bike is locked, but it's also right near where Bub is waiting to engage in some sociopathic shit. Give me your keys, the more understanding service industry worker says. I'll grab your bike and then we can let you out the back where, the, where we receive shipments. You agree, hoping Bub didn't see you ride in on your bike. You should have had more faith in essential workers. You should have had more faith in late capitalism and the goodness of people. Here it is rolling along the wax buffed indifference of a supermarket aisle, your bike. You're ushered along to the stockroom's receiving platform. You feel like royalty. This is your parade of unintended consequences. Someone rolls up the receiving room door like a red carpet and the night sky pours in, projecting emptiness onto a different kind of emptiness. Well, the more understanding clerk says, you should be okay now. Thank you for your service, you tell him, stepping onto the loading dock with your bike. Then the door closes and you're alone, a kind of vastness and a void. You decide you're gonna put a sign up in your bedroom window commending frontline workers when you get home. Bang some pots or something at 5 p.m. If that's when nurses change shifts, you have no fucking idea when nurses do anything. And you definitely don't know where Bub is. He could be anywhere out here. It could be in the weeds, among the discarded milk cartons and scattered stars. It's not clear to you at all how a truck could navigate this passage and keep supply chains moving. It's a narrow alley that leads to a parking lot on one side and a short but sheer drop on the other. You can't risk the parking lot, so you somehow scale the weird landscaping at the other end while carrying your bike. You put rubber to pavement and choose to take a winding, uncommon route home. Under Ontario law, it's surprisingly easy to kill a cyclist without consequence. Some months later, after the government has relaxed pandemic rules, you're at this neighborhood pub. You don't feel like a regular because you're indifferent to the place. It just happens to be one of the only spots with craft beer in your area. The night is a blur and you've just spent it talking shit about books to the bartender, Bailey. Whenever you do come here, you feel like she responds to you on an academic level, that she'll discuss ideas, but doesn't care to get very close. And you can't imagine why. You don't notice a guy take the empty bar stool beside you. You don't notice until you do. And here, you're about to discover another one of the trappings of being a drunk. You may not know people, but they know you. They may be only on your periphery, or maybe you never even saw them before, but they've seen you. They know about you, or at least they've heard. And even if they haven't, they think they have. So while you may not think about them, they think about you. And what do they think about when they think about you? Your head meeting a hardwood bar like it is now. They're the laughter in the stands, the whispers in the crowd, 
This explains why nobody helps you, the drunk, in your time of need. Cheers, bub, the guy says. That was so wonderfully awkward and hilarious. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. That was, as usual, I, I, I don't know, you just you just have such a wonderful knack for this particular kind of like self-effacing dark comedy. And that was very, very funny. Um, thank you so much. My Josh, that, that line you added at the very end ruled. That was like perfect, perfect. Oh, very right. Right. Thank you. And that was because of you, because that was uh, what helped. Because initially actually my friend who read the first draft that you had read, wasn't actually clear what had happened. And I hope now it's much clearer what happened without saying what that happened. Little, that little touch was just so, so perfect. Like, yeah, it's like a whole story in that one line. Perfect. And I got to say that, um, yeah, both things like actually happened to me, but not in that way. So that's fine. Wait, wait, this was a true story? <laughs> well, it's two true stories that I've melded into one oh, okay. untrue story. It's auto fiction. <laughs> it's a way like little husk. husk right <laughs> no that was great josh and i'm i'm very fair i i i it's it's a real shame that happened to you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you you i know you had trouble even saying that because you know. <laughs> <laughs> no i i i mean that no that's the now that that's a horror story you know because i think about how many times like i am i have like massive social anxiety and whenever i like even go to the supermarket or anything i'm on like a razor's edge and i can't imagine i can just imagine like having a moment where you fucking it, like this guy pisses you off and you say something and then this whole like terrible traumatic series of what it does is I know people don't think I'm a good person, but you know I worked service industry stuff until I was like 26. I was stocking uh, cans on the shelves and stuff, and so I have real like I'm not I, I I know I write about it sarcastically in this story, yeah, which I think makes sense and works. But like when it actually happens, whenever I hear someone giving like a cashier shit, I literally say, "Shut up, bitch!" Like I just like just like, right. nobody wants to hear this. Move along, you know and I did this on that on that night and it happened differently a little bit. I was actually escorted out the back in the same way and they did get my bike. It was actually quite dramatic. Anyway, right. we'll that. but um, thank you for the feedback and I'm glad it seems like I'm going to work on the bit because that was a polished first draft, but thank It seems like the ingredients are there. So much. Yeah, no, it was great. It was great. Thank you, Josh. That's awesome. Um, Griffin. Griffin, you're up next. Are you still with us, Griffin? Yeah, I am. All right. So I'm going to read some of my translations of Catullus again. Uh, I've got two for you guys tonight. Uh, the first one is Catullus32. And could you not uh, post the links on Twitter? Um, cool. So th this is the first one. This is Catullus32. I'm not going to read the Latin this time, just the English. So, please, honey, darling, my sweet baby girl, tell me to come over and do me a favor. Don't lock me out. Don't leave your house. Stay home and get ready to make the beast with two backs and do the horizontal tango and go down to pound town and do the nasty and bump uglies and knock boots and make love and have sex and fuck. Please, if you're down, tell me now before my morning wood rips right through my boxers and my jeans. Uh, and here is the second one. Uh, this one is actually a translation of a translation. This is Catullus's translation of Sappho 31. At least the first three stanzas are. Um, to me, he is a god, no, more than a god. If he can sit by you, see you, hear your sweet laugh, which steals your poor poet's senses. For when I look at you, my voice flees, my tongue falls limp, through my limbs, threads of flame flow, my ears ring with their own sound, over my eyes, twin shadows fall. Your problem, Catullus, too much spare time. You revel in it, you throw yourself into it. 
that this has ruined ancient kings and great cities. I love how modern these are. I love how modern you've made these poems through your translation. Thank which you. I think really, like, really is a wonderful credit to the author as well. Like, I think, like, really, like, rigid translations do a real disservice to the author and to the work because you know on some level like they are having like the same experiences as us and the same like <laughs> like like have the same like sick morbid fascinations that we do right and i think that in both of these cases you've like really captured that wonderfully thank you um i have received a a private message requesting that i do it in the latin uh, unfortunately, the Latin's not as fun because that whole like do the horizontal tango to fuck section in the Latin is just let's fuck nine times, um, <laughs> which is much less exciting to read. Um, well, Will, I prefer my version. William, what you said was what I was yeah what I was actually uh, saying to Griffin in a in a DM because we're you know we're pretty pretty close so we're like tight. I'm pretty sometimes like you know I just DM one on Twitter. Uh, DM her. Sorry. Fuck. Shit. You know what? I'm sorry. You know. You know what? It, you're it, good. It's okay. What were you uh, saying? Once we start recording, your strikes roll over. So you're yeah. on strike one instead of four. Now. <laughs> I was. I was. I was. Uh, I was saying about how uh, it's a reminder of how people have always been pretty much the same. Yeah. And that's what we were talking about. And that's. I mean, that's why I love literature because it, again. Uh, just goes back so much further than uh, it doesn't go back further than music, but you can't actually hear the music uh, <laughs> before a recording. But you can read the original words, and you, but you can see how people were, um, yeah, pretty much always the same, and just other things have evolved. Um, um, I was I was saying to another friend on uh, on Discord that um, Catullus is basically like. Uh, some bi trust fund kid who like is uh just came back from study abroad and is writing poetry about how his girlfriend and his boyfriend have both dumped him um it's great i love him although one thing i do wonder about just with that modern translation thing just as a brief aside is that i think for poetry and i was uh, i recommend i recommended to griffin before the moon woke me up nine times those basho poem um so the 17th century haiku that have been upgrade, uh, updated um, and almost remixed. And it works for poetry. I do wonder how sustaining a contemporary voice through a, um, you know, a, a longer prose work of like 30,000 words would work and at what point, I mean, I'm cool with someone doing that, but um, is it translation at that point or, some, or, or does there need to be another word for it? Or is it just like, you know, uh, remix in brackets or a chill out mix or something? Yeah, um, the the I I haven't read any any prose that's prose tends to be more literally translated, um, just because like I don't know you can you can still get like Caesar I don't care if you translate like the Gallic Wars into a modern voice it doesn't matter, um, but I think something like um, like Apuleius is the Golden Ass. Uh, or um, Lucian's True History, which is like a sci-fi novel where they go to the moon. Um, something like that could benefit a lot from a modern prose translation. Uh, but right now, I'm in a poetry mode, so I can't think about prose or I'll, I'll lose steam. <laughs> I was planning to maybe do uh, like a whole chapbook of translations, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm almost. I mean, fingers crossed that like I don't. I don't know. Have a horrible depressive episode and end up not doing anything more than what I have. But yeah, ideally, there. I'll be translating my favorite Catullus poems. Uh, and publish them in them via uh, Gate Zero, which is a press some friends of mine started last year. That'd be cool. And you know who uh, I actually told uh, Sarah Trick, who's my colleague who actually attends some of these. I think you, you know, some of you have uh, met her. 
and I, I told her instantly about grip and she knew who, who it was right away. So I just felt dumb. I, but you know, I'm not classically educated like some of us in this, uh, in this zoom chat, but she knew right away and she thought it was, you know, so even people who are coming from that same background think there's value to it. Not the oh, yeah. But, uh, but yeah. Yeah. No, well, just keep reading them at Misery Loves Company because I will. I will. And it is some kind of initiative. I know when uh, it's helped me keep writing, you know, sometimes. Uh, next up, Gabriel. You still with us, Gabriel? Yeah. Um... And you're going to be reading a piece that was published on Expat today, right? Yeah, it's called uh, "The Space Between Two and Three. I hope uh, hope some of this translates. I'm going to have some musical accompaniment. Um, awesome. Let's see. Let me just get this started. As her vision rebooted with darkness. The expanse deceived its very presence. Then varying depths of glitter light she could only assume were stars. They grew in size from pinpricks to nickels until she realized they weren't growing, they were speeding towards her. She had no arms to flinch with once the first layer passed her by. Sky Connolly was now disembodied in the absolute surrender of pure consciousness. Once the residue of her earthbound recall compared it to driving through a blizzard, that's when she knew that it was her that was speeding towards them. But this too did pass, like a nagging magnet pulling her into an another interdeterminate section of the vast black. She gained rear view perspective without the swivel of a neck, humbled that even a million balls of burning gas could abandon her, though her ability to emote also began to dissipate. Unencumbered by any further weight of ups and downs, still, Sky Connolly ascended into a space beyond the stars, into a, an area of man-made illumination. Rather, a celestial whirlpool of synthetic debris. Because satellites are geostationary, it is assumed that the signals they send from Earth travel there in a tidy, orderly stream, then bounce back to the planet in a similar discipline. But consider the web, now the accumulated scaffolding of civilization, its velocity, concentration, and frequency of usage. No one on Earth can imagine the backsplash, the stray droplets of static information going rogue down an erratic stream and into the void. Invisible to mortal optics, this polluted ethereal river of slighted intelligence could only be confirmed by those caught in its undertow, the spirits of the departed. Ascending back into the stardust from which they came, every one of the deceased now head right for this intersection of absolute detour, flung into a stillborn swirl of ever suspending Big Bang, a purgatory of techno refuse. Sky's essence arrived there like a lost child on the first day of school, suddenly robbed of a spiritual instinct. Her only option, improvisation. Once she saw all the other straight clouds of gas were not much different than her. So playfully she mingled, overlapping with the veteran elements. Until she saw actual little pieces of her earth self floating in the fray, like shards of a broken mirror. She repelled herself from the gaseous masses once she realized that they too were all trying to put themselves back together again. It was two weeks after the funeral. If you didn't count the largest detail, the Jackson Baker's best friend Sky was no longer tethered to the earth. It looked like nothing had changed. Because two weeks later, Jackson was still staring at her photos on her LifeCast Observer, her social media account that had since become her unsettling digital tombstone, a still life chronological montage where she now had zero control over the content, much less the comments. He typed another one as tears welled up in his eyes. You were the most original person I've ever met, Sky. For someone who seemed like they fell out of the sky above, it's somehow the most difficult thing in the world to accept that you eventually had to go back there. He deleted it right away. Not because he didn't meet every word, but because he felt foolish after scrolling up and seeing everyone else, most likely those who barely knew her, riffing on her unique name. They all made sentimental puns that might make this look one dimensional, or worse, suggest that he didn't have anything more profound to say. Another subconscious contest to prove who knew the dead girl better in this performative electro wake with no end in sight. But he did know her the best. He didn't have to prove it by writing juvenile graffiti on her wall. He had all his memories of Sky up there in his brain, the oldest, most reliable, and thankfully most private computer God ever created. He slammed his laptop shut in frustration, a vain gesture of finality. Yet he felt stuck between a hyphenated footnote of mourning as he was experiencing a fine print too small and detailed for inclusion in the five stages of grief. 
Jackson, Sky, and Marco were inseparable. Now there were only two. Marco found himself in the overwhelming role of consoling Jackson since he had an emotional head start. In spite of her privacy, Marco had long confronted Sky about her reckless experimentation with Uplift, the popular yet con controversial over-the-counter antidepressant. So his grieving began when he gave up talking sense into her. So like, what stage of grief do you think you're in then, said Marco. I don't know, like somewhere between four and five, in the middle of depression and acceptance, I guess, said Jackson, Jackson ashamed of his stagnation. Well, you probably feel stuck because you are stuck. Let me ask you, how often are you creeping on her life cast observer? Because you know, that's just gonna make it worse. Man, honestly, if I'm not at work or talking to you, I am on that shit. I can't stop. I, I'm always worried about what you told me. What, what did I tell you about a person's three deaths? Yeah, so what about it? Well, I could accept her first death, her body no longer working. I can see how this is all temporary at best, he said, motioning to his chest and torso with his two fingers. I can even, I can even accept her second death. I might have had tears in my eyes that day, but I forced myself to watch every inch as they lowered her casket into the ground. But a person's third death, the whole forgetting about them thing, that's one I refuse to deal with. Can you blame me? No, I understand, said Marco, but you got it a little twisted. A person's third death isn't just us forgetting about them while we're alive. I don't think that's possible the way we love Sky. The third death would be you or I dying. Eventually, all of Sky's loved ones will pass away, so we'll be unable to think about her anymore. That's the third death. Her circle fading so we can no longer keep her inside. Jackson thought it over. I don't know, man. I've been, like, taking uplift and just, like, everyone's been complaining. My recommended doses barely work anymore. Maybe I should just take as much as she did. At least I wouldn't miss her this bad. Man, you sound ridiculous. You want to die like all these fools? I really can't believe this uplift shit is even legal. A person can only get so happy, you know? It's no different from any other dope, man. You get so high and there's nowhere else to go except go die. I didn't mean to imply I'd actually kill myself, man. I mean, Sky was crazy enough to cook it up and shoot it. I don't have the guts to mess with needles anyway. I was just thinking I could make a big take a bigger dose than usual. Maybe it could just clear this fog so I could focus, gain some perspective, you know? Okay, so you're saying you wanna turn your brain on instead of off, right? Yeah, like what if I made a ritual out of it with a slightly larger dose? Might help me feel closer to her, see what happens, you know? Well, it was only a brief smirk, one that Jackson tried to hide by pursing his lips. Marco saw he had gotten through to him. He threw his arms around him, patting him on the back. Damn, so this, does this mean I actually get to have a night off or do I have to report back to you the second you can't handle your drugs, said Marco, laughing. Armed with a 40 of malt liquor and the fresh pack of uplift he bought from the same store, Jackson approached the grass at Beggar's Park. He planted himself on the green planks of the bench, squirting and squinting as he watched the sun set behind the high rises of downtown, like an underbite of broken fangs in front of a blinding fire. Jackson was leaving himself vulnerable in such an exposed public space, but he wanted to be as far from distraction as possible, namely his laptop. He sighed as he sat down, now aware that he couldn't inhabit his own bedroom without being seduced by that techno window to the world, which sadly, he was now only using to commune with someone that no longer inhabited it. He inhaled the brisk evening air as he reluctantly shoved the bright periwinkle tablet in his mouth. Determined, he followed that tablet with another, then a pull from his bottle. Since he recently appeared immune to what LifeCast Pharmaceuticals and Wellness deemed as the recommended dosage, two tablets no more than every six hours, he began popping them into his mouth like movie theater popcorn, as if it were merely a show about to unfold. Jackson felt that familiar tingling in his shoulders, accentuating a growing euphoria up his neck, and he continued to roll them back in tiny circles. His head floated like a buoy in the calm yet unsettling ocean as he noticed the 16-dose package had just a few left. Satisfied he had consumed the moment, he allowed his burdened head to recline backwards as the rest of his body oozed into molded comfort on the stiff bench. His eyes fluttered closed. Boom. The sound enforced like a bomb. His whole, his whole being as the projectile shrapnel. Jackson's periphery went black before a glittery spread of stars faded into view. God, finally, someone is open. Jackson? 
He opened his eyes to sky, his dearly departed friend who remained dear, though appeared no longer departed, past sky. She stood there looking at him, smiling, though frustrated as she threw her hands up. Jackson? Sky? Yeah, it's me, kind of. Sorry, this place is a mess. She put another record on her turntable. You know, I don't even want any of this, she motioned to her albums. I'm just using it because it's all still here for some reason. Jackson's sight came into sharper focus. All her possessions lay faded, scattered over his dark room, which appeared in virtual, virtual negative film roll of her once vibrant apartment. No posters or scotch tape photo collages of her and their friends on the walls, just different shapes and varying shades of hue inside a pitch black cube of indeterminate size where only their bodies were illuminated. Uh, Sky, how are you? The closer he walked to the wall, the wider the angles fanned out, ever expanding into darkness. Uh, I mean, I'm fine, I guess. We don't really do that though here. Don't do what? You know, like emotion. What do you mean? The question was delivered with a slight surprise. He realized he hadn't given her the hug he vowed to give her if he ever saw her again. And paralytic awe, those synapses wouldn't fire. What do I mean? I mean, that's why I'm stuck here. Too much emotion, too much information. You guys wouldn't let me go. You, Jackson, would not let me go. But you're the one that left us, Sky. You left us no choice but to let you go. I'm sorry, but in order to really let me go, I actually need you to release me. Allow me to be dead. That's what I've been trying to tell you this whole time. All this time? You're telling me you didn't hear me, or at least, like, feel me speaking to you when you were staring at me through your screen for the past two weeks? Well, I did notice that no matter how many times I saw a photo of you or anything resembling you on your LifeCast account, the worse I felt. Yes, exactly. That was me telling you to leave me alone, that you were doing it wrong. I swear this feels like screaming at a massive crowd who claim they're there for me, but their own chatter drowns me out, even though it's me they're trying to recapture. She paused, staring at them in the eye, or staring at him straight in the eye, but careful not to expose too much because any semblance of passion might confuse her message. That's what it feels like, like I'm captured, stuck. They stood in momentary silence. She knew he needed time for it to sneak in, to sink in. He felt a shadow of pity, considering he didn't know that those were real words she was talking with, just his interpretation of her consciousness, her sending signals. But it seemed to be working. Can I ask you what you meant when you said, finally, someone is open? Sure, it's a little complex, so please try to keep up. Pascal fought to find consistency in her drone so he can interpret it as earth words. It was no longer her way of communicating. In a way, it's natural you all commune with me through the LifeCast Observer, where a lot of your shared memories are how you prefer to remember me, but we don't get the same satisfaction on the other side here. We can see you crying, having that catharsis, but we can't really respond. That's because emotion is an earthbound construct made only to interpret one another's vibrations. Since web technology is new on earth, a lot of us are fastened here on the rim of the drain, if you will, trying to tell you to stop occupying us so we could pass over properly. Here, look. Pascal took Jackson by the hand and led him to the wall. A window appeared, offering a view of endless rows of other black cubes suspended in black void just like hers. Now in context, the view of this totality resembled an endless, endless battalion of fallen dominoes. Here, come closer. Jackson squinted his eyes, focusing on each cube's contents. Each one was inhabited by another past version of a departed body, screaming at portions of pixelated data. Some were trying to talk sense into whoever was on the other side. Others were in the throes of abandonment, giving up their own ghosts. It was hard to watch, so he took a step back to process. I know this is a lot, but I think you're getting it. The toughest part is that we can't blame you because you are basically looking at, well, our interface. But we have to blame you because you're making this harder on us than you can ever imagine. You see it as empathy, 
as connection when it's actually a selfish gesture. Imagine a doctor refusing to cut your umbilical cord, just staring at you while you scream. So why me, Sky? How was I the one you were able to get through to? Well, there's two factors here, and they're both really difficult for me to say to you. Why? Okay, one, I'm not condoning it, but you nearly consumed the same overdose of uplift that I did. You're lucky to be alive. Your saving grace is that you didn't shoot it up like I did, like an idiot. But I'm grateful you had the guts to make a bridge to me like this, so I thank you. Okay, and the second? Don't make me say it. Can we just move on? Please, Sky, I'm not going to help you. I'm going to help you. If I'm going to help you, I need to know this. Well, it was because of that one time. What one time? Please don't make me spell it out. That one night in my apartment when we... Sure, sure. I've never forgotten it, Sky. Why can't you say it out loud? Because we have to unlearn emotion, graduate from information here in order to pass on. If I expose myself too much, then maybe you will too. Then it will be my fault if you can't go back. I can't do that to you. It took all her strength to contort her face back to stoic. Realizing that she may have expressed too much anger, the pendulum threatened to swing to the opposite extreme. Sky, this sounds like the same excuses you were making back when you were alive, when you can't ha couldn't handle your own feelings. She locked eyes with him, making sure she could see her tears welling up, yet refusing to go full sobs. Sky, just tell me what you want. What do you need me to do now that you have me here alone? Nodding her head thoughtfully, she wiped a tear in spite of her dormant urge for exposure. Come on, if there's anything you need me to relay, make it quick. I think I feel a window back. She leaned over to him and began whispering. It started in plain English before dissolving into a monotonous sustain. Jackson, wake up, bro. You there? Marco was leaning over him. <clears throat> on the bench at the park, slapping him lightly on the cheeks to make him come to. His eyes wouldn't open, but his mouth began to speak, her email, her password. Delete it immediately, all of it fast, please, he whispered faintly. Confused and worried how ghastly intoxicated Jackson was, Marco still took the orders as gospel. He took out his phone and began thumbing his way into Sky's live cast account, occasionally one handing it as he put his arm around Jackson for warmth. Marco shuddered, the way Jackson's mouth kept opening and shutting like he was speaking somewhere else to someone else. He saw Jackson's lips begin to pucker, his tongue emerging through his undulating lips as it licked the night air. His breathing got heavy, culminating with a, an amorous, amorous moan, then one last breath from Jackson Baker's earth body. Back in the cube, the two became one, then became none, then became everything always and all time as the remedial images of their human forms dissolved no longer obligated to illustrate themselves to those they left behind. That was fucking wild. How did you do that? What were you using? Oh, I got, it's, um, it's a synthesizer. Oh, okay. I had no idea, but the effect was amazing and really per perfectly captured what you were doing with the punctuation and the story. I think. Oh, good. I'm glad, I'm glad it worked out. Yeah, it was like a last minute decision, but I'm glad. I haven't touched that thing since before the pandemic, so I'm glad I got to bust it out again. That was fucking fantastic. And you know, while I was listening to you, it struck me how much range you have as an author. Like, this is so phenomenally unlike anything I've heard you read before. Like, in its experimental structure, in the way you use punctuation, in, like, the sci-fi kind of conceit that, that you have going here. Like, this is so... It was wonderful and it's so wildly different. So it's one of those things where it's like, holy shit, like there's so much like there's so much more that this author can do that I was totally unaware of. So thank you so much, Gabriel. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. As someone who has like zero range and everything is at one note, very much respect your range. Oh, thank you. I I have to thank my friend John Paul from um our local he's my best friend. He's like a sci-fi fanatic, so we, he's a huge influence on me. I, I, I write um, for his sci-fi podcast sometimes. He's kind of opened that whole world to me. 
Yeah, I, I, I love the conceit of that, uh, the science fiction stuff, the idea that, like, passing on is some kind of, like, almost event horizon, kind of, where, like, people just kind of get caught and can't move on because of, like, these signals that are being sent from Earth, you know, like, signals about, you know, like, literal signaling, like, um, you know, things written about them in electronic format and stuff like that. That is just so cool. Yeah, I think it, it confuses the spirit, you know? Yeah, <laughs> that's really neat. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, next up is um, Jesse. Jesse Hilson asked to read um, at the beginning. Are you still with us, Jesse? Yes, I am. Cool. I'm, new he I'm new here, and uh, I think I'm probably on the outsider spectrum r rather than the transgressive spectrum. Um, I'm going to read a poem, and... I don't have a link for it. I'm sorry. I just, I'm going to read it. Yeah. It's actually, do you mind if I uh, mention that we're going to publish it? I guess. Yes. Yeah. In <laughs> August, you said so, August, is that right? Yeah. Probably very early August. This okay. Is published in Misery Tourism. Yeah. Thank right. you so much for joining us, Jesse. Thank you. Um, from what I've read of your poetry, it's fucking awesome. So okay. yeah, it's all yours. This poem is called Fugitive Completeness. Recall the large collection of X-rated magazines passed around your dorm by that curious freshman who had, with a Sharpie, carefully blacked out every heart on then eventually each man's whole body. So finally, the women appeared to copulate with man voids to perform page after page of phantom fellatio. An invisible man's presence could only be inferred, not from limbs or hair or wrinkled sheets, but from his female partner's corrugated, punctuated eyebrows, which took on a distressed symmetry whenever she was in Venerian mirth. The intertwining bodies in the pictures were haunted by that kid's fear of the gay avalanche that falls in through the eye's pupil, obliterate the man and keep the woman. The performance artist Nero, envious of prior winners of Rome's oratory contests, ordered each copy of their statues to be defaced, then hurled into public laboratories. Soviet ministers out of favor were shot and edited out of group photos like a pockmark, leaving behind outlines to be filled with fictional gray foliage by terrified forgers. The disfigured, the amputees, the ruins swim up at you from a clouded over sea floor of art history. Extrapolate all above the ankles since the feet inside the display case are all you have left. Stripe out a line of cocaine for the Sphinx to vacuum up her missing nose. Handcuff the Venus de Milo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesse. I already said in my email to you how much I love this poem, but just listening to it again, I really love like the, the journey that this piece goes on because it starts with something like so funny and so juvenile, the idea of like, you know, a kid blacking out the penises in a porn magazine because he doesn't, like he doesn't want anyone to think he's gay. And it goes on this like incredible, profound spiritual journey to that amazing final line where you really like, that journey from something so silly and juvenile to like the whole of Western culture is just, it's really remarkable and it's really profound. And I love what you're doing in that poem. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to read here tonight. I just wanted to say, I've been watching these, I've been watching Misery Love Co Loves Company on YouTube for a, a quite a while. And I'm a, such a fan of everybody here. And uh, I think of you as all celebrities and uh, um, I'm happy. To so happy to be here. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. And I'm so happy that's to a, you join us. That's oh, amazing. I can't believe people watch it. <laughs> uh, 
I, I, I wasn't sure. That's so yeah. cool. Well, I mean, I had someone that was trying to screw me over and they were watching every video to see if I would say something problematic, but I can't imagine someone for any other reason than that would be watching. So that's amazing. Although, you know, we're not giving ourselves enough credit because I think some good stuff uh, comes out of here. Uh, Unity's stuff, for example, is always, uh, anyway, there, there, there is good stuff and people should be watching and we should have more um, viewers, I think. And yeah. No, I mean, I, people do watch, I can say, because I've seen like, you know, I can see the analytics and stuff. It's not a huge number of people, but people do watch. Um, and anyway, so glad to have you here. It, yeah. That was really good. Thank you, Thank you so much, Jesse. Um, so that's it for our scheduled readers for tonight. Did anyone, it's open mic time. We're finally going to do an open mic here. So does anyone want to read? Um, Oh, I wasn't trying to. I wasn't trying to correct Mulane and be like, "Oh, you shouldn't say. You shouldn't say that. We're like very valued, so you shouldn't say that nobody would want." It. I didn't mean it that way. I was just. Oh, I I know Josh. No, I was just thinking in terms of like the only feedback I've heard of from there is like the "Go Epstein yourself" <laughs> comment. Yeah. <laughs> I thought this was a list support group. You know that one. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> No, we don't get many comments besides that one very, <laughs> very brutal and hilarious one. Um, oh, okay. I see, uh, I see OC, OF Sierra and Rudy both have offered to read. Um, I, uh, I have an, an alternate version of one of the poems I read that I could read that is, I think people will appreciate it. Why don't Griffin? Why don't you go first, and then um, and then O can go, and then Rudy. And All right. I just wanted to say it was going to be it's going to be so great with Rudy reading to have a, a black perspective. <laughs> Strike two. <laughs> you don't know how black this one is going to get, actually. <laughs> it's, it's going to be All right. Super black. So this is William. You said you said me first, or? Yeah, yeah, Griffin. Okay. So this is this is uh, poem thirty-two again. Um, please, honey, darling, my sweet baby girl, tell me to come over. Do me a favor. Don't lock your out. Don't lock me out. Don't leave your house. Stay home and get ready to vulcanize the whoopee stick in the ham wallet. Then cattle prod the oyster ditch with the lap rocket. Then batter dip the cranny X in the gut locker. Then retrofit the pudding hatch with the blink swatter. Then power drill the yippy bog with the dude piston. Then pressure watch the quiver bone and the bitch wrinkle. Then cannonball the fiddle cove with the pork steeple. Put the you know what in the you know where. Pronto. Please, if you're down, tell me now before my morning wood rips right through my boxers and my jeans. Please remind me what that's from. Uh, that's uh, Foxtrot Uniform Charlie Kilo by the Bloodhound Gang. Bloodhound Gang, right. Oh. I am wow. so ashamed that I remembered that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my, that was my, the alternate one that I, I ended up not, not going with for the actual uh, final version, but. God damn it. Okay. <laughs> Oh, you're up. <laughs> oh. I see you've unmuted your mic, but I'm not sure if we can hear you. All right, I'm just going to take the headphones out. Can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Um, all right, so I decided on doing something from the Philosopher King. When his first wife divorced him, the philosopher king had nowhere to live. A temporary setback, after all, he was still an NYU professor. His marriage was annulled on a beautiful spring morning as the days were just starting to get hot. He took his paperwork for a nap in the shade of a big tree in Washington Square Park. When he woke, the sun was setting. He took his divorce papers to the gym for a few hours and spent the rest of the night in NYU's library. He thought, I could spend every day like this. In the morning when he was tired, he went back out to the oak tree and slept in the sun. Family plays ar played around him. Grads, undergrads got stoned and stared blindly at their textbooks. 
He woke up to teach class, to buy food, and to shower at the gym. In the evenings, he read in the library. One day, he woke up late for class and crossed the street at a run, eyes locked on the front door of the English building. A car blew a red and plowed into a bike messenger. She let go of her bike and slid across the pavement while the bike flattened the philosopher king. As far as he was aware, he was standing one minute and horizontal the next. Pain flashed through his body and worried onlookers circled like fish. The car tried to make a U-turn and flee the scene but smashed into a planter. The driver emerged and stood next to his totaled car like a penitent schoolboy. When the ambulance arrived, they wanted the king's address. Nothing he said could dissuade them from asking for it. He told them the date, the name of the president, the color of the sky, and his own age, but they insisted on his address. And so at last he told them that he was between homes. Where did he live? He tried to explain that he had a favorite tree in the park he slept under on warm days and a library to stay in at night, but that was unacceptable. God damn it, he shouted. That woman took direct impact and you're worried about me? Look at me, look into my eyes, take my blood pressure, check my vitals, tell me why I'm the patient, give me one good reason and maybe I'll think about getting into that van. The police arrived and took away his chance to get in the ambulance. They cuffed him, tossed him in the back of the squad car and drove around for a little before they brought him to the precinct. One night in holdings, two in proper jail. They got a little jumpy when, we, when he began screaming for his lawyer. Not just any lawyer, but one specific one that he could name off the top of his head. He didn't even need to see a judge because the presence of a lawyer immediately docked the charges. Why? Because he was being charged with vagrancy and the presence of a properly retained attorney made that charge impossible. He had pulled rank on the public servants. They escorted him out of bookings like doormen, smiling and bowing before even the slightest essence of authority. That's right, you button up rats, mongrel, swine. This is a tenured college professor. English curse words don't befit your status as animals because even a motherfucker or a cocksucker implies personhood. Maybe in a few years you can graduate to asshole, that puckered ring of squeezing muscle which belongs to a person. He went first to his attorneys to debrief. The attorney couldn't deduce from the charges what had actually happened in the park. The philosopher king thought they'd have a good laugh over the events, but once he was done, the attorney just looked confused. You're living in the park? Ah, an explanation was needed. He talked about the trees and the sunshine and the, and the library and the gym, but he could see on the attorney's face that none of this was enough. He'd taken a step too far outside convention and could no longer be understood by those still inside it. He found himself at the intersection between law and convention that he recognized as a place he first encountered as a child on the playground. He had broken the rules. Like in kindergarten, he could deeply upset others by breaking the rules, and whether anyone was materially affected wasn't an issue. Without protection from the rules, he could be accused of every scandal and sin imaginable. Vagrancy, assault, theft, tax evasion, vandalism, loitering. Like convention, the rules were a purely metaphysical infrastructure, lacking enough substance to hold a shape. Like the law, its fringes were patrolled by watchdogs furnished with the state's consent to inflict violence on stray lambs. Inside its walls were common sense logic conclusions like having a roof and a store of excess food. The philosopher king had no qualms with the rules, only slight disappointment with himself for being freshly reacquainted with them. He'd handled the invisible boundary without grace. Embarrassing. The philosopher king's only real flaw was being a sore loser, but at least he knew that about himself. He put on a display of humility and allowed the attorney to lecture him. This was more for the attorney's benefit than the king's. He nodded humbly as the attorney told him off for his bad behavior and promised to find a new apartment immediately. In reality, well, he wasn't averse to getting a new apartment. The summer nights still stretched out luxuriously, offering countless warm nights wandering between the library and the bars of the West Village, but it would get old soon. Already he was tired of the public face of the gym bathroom. Just once he'd like to take a shower and not need to get dressed immediately. The novelty was losing its sheen in the wake of his arrest, and without it, he could feel his summer vacation coming to a close. No more Boy Scouts camping adventure. He was being called back to the comforts of home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can't see me putting my phone down, but I'm done. That was fantastic. That, such a good story. And I, the dialogue, or I guess you should, I should say the monologue between the, the philosopher king and the police was just spectacular and I I don't know I you had you had a line in there about like 
the intersection between law and convention that really gets at like so like the artifice of like so fucking much that goes on like in, in like polite society right and how like so many of our expectations are more like these quiet coercions it's just a beautiful story thank you so much and very it's funny um rudy you're up next I think unless I, yeah, Griffin. Yeah, unless unless anybody else wants to go, somebody else wants to jump in. No, you you can go, and if anyone would like to read after Rudy, um, just uh, put something in the chat, and we'll get to you. Okay, it's all yours, Rudy. Okay, so this, which I'm gonna link um, in the chat, is a poem, I guess, about um, some feels I had about the gorilla glue thing or the gorilla glue girl thing when it happened i richie wrote this a while ago uh it's some gorilla glue girl mashup with um i guess hair physics in video games so yeah i'll just read it physics for gorilla glue girl currents the joneses demand we employ an extra nigger shiny black and green and gold or jack will beat us and bond that some bitch to a free slit slot take the big load off maine weave newtonian dreams rigid bodies gyrate in there shake it baby said with 2000s era machismo it's hot enough to fry a goddamn egg or white ropey sticky goo while soft bodies are torn like bed sheets, Victorian dresses, Hamiltonian excesses, Jefferson couldn't stop little hot messes, vertexes are parted white for dick. A fluid situation. Touch me and get stuck to this silent tar baby who will be awesome. Sketch universes where ebony witches might carry tanglefoot bags stamped with any monkey logo. DC 15 to settle down. Black cousin it. Because we're hexing beyond those crypt-dominated days of choosing a single model, style 16, from a lineup. So enjoy dynamic black bouncy strands, voluminous black masses, black excellence, and black desert. Go be? Oh, no. Go buy this latest muscled buck to crunch triangle-shaped particulars of reality, glowy caltrops busting under leathery, ashy feet. Pidgeage for a pig age. Punch cards got nothing on this molten, multi threaded fury. And this hot garbage poem is punching down, says some ally bitch on Twitter with the enviable black locks. This tethered jigaboo is Octavia's butler, and the fantasy is fucking intense in Tennessee or in NYC or N, where N, you see, is a number of polygons larger than hundreds. Because only whites look compelling and super hot with less than that. That's it. God fucking damn. I love the sheer density of this thing. I've read it a couple of times since you initially posted it. And every time I look at it, I get a new reference and I get the way, like, I figure out something new about how, like, line X connects to line Y. And there's just like your poetry is usually like very I don't want to say dense but very dense with references and allusions and stuff and this one in particular and yet it's like so like intensely viciously sort of passionate too and personal too I don't know it's it's a great it's a great fucking poem and we yeah we the fucking is... this one this is a Twitter exclusive I think uh, yeah. The fucking like like density of wordplay in this is like incredible. Like it's astonishing. I love it. Thanks, thanks. Um, I uh, I wrote it like I said. It's about I guess um, hair in video games. <laughs> uh, the physics reference is a reference to the physics card, um, which came out I think around 2008. Uh, it's an extra card you put in your computer 
and it makes the graphics more bigger, basically. <laughs> and actually now it's on every GPU. Physics is like a platform on every GPU, but yeah, that's that's what preference is. Thank you so much, Rudy. Um, I see Blick, you'd like to read. You have a piece you'd like to read? Well, wait, I, I just wanted to say Rudy oh. as, as uh, a, a POC author, I find this really brave. Thank you. Strike three? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that was the cut where it was like, Dang, that could have uh... straight two and a half. He's like really on the edge now. <laughs> uh, anyway. Love you too, Josh. <laughs> Blake, uh, you're you definitely <clears throat> doing the piece that was just published yesterday. And uh, are you still with us? Okay, uh, thanks. This is it. <clears throat> I've been I've been doing a practice. Uh, it seems to be like an ancient thing between the the Romans and the, the Greeks tonight. This is a, a piece that's based on a photograph that uh, Jana Hunterova, who's a award-winning Prague photographer, uh, shot in December. And so, uh, let's see, see, that's the photo. It's called uh, City Sidewalk Christmas Eve 2020. It's a stream of consciousness without any punctuation, so uh, uh, bear with me, please. <clears throat> Do my squeaks and squeals sound like frightened cries of hopeful breaths <clears throat> crushed inside a fabric of society that brings exhaled warmth to my facing of known yet unseen dangers as I squat before an empty street of holiday cheer fear, echoing in each pluck and glide of string? an oral gift of homage to missing loved ones and the magical realism of an old fat white man swath in red, bringing joy to sleeping uncaged children, dreaming of parental oversight and charity down chimney slides into cabin fevers, <clears throat> hopefully void of dry coughs and a lack of taste that ignores the seasonal celebration <clears throat> of a poor babe who just three calendar months later will be a 33-year-old who's humiliated, tortured, and brutally slain because of a passionate call for change that replaces hate with love and fear with joy. So I sit on this bleak, frigid sidewalk, accepting and resisting the pain of an unraveling Christmas present and uncertain Christmas future, with the sweet memory of Christmas past offered up by frozen fingers, fiddling musical notes I pray may tender a bit of hope and comfort as glorious attendants fight to save strangers inside the brightly lit hospital across the street. Thanks. That was beautiful. That was beautiful and like so perfectly captures the like the despair of last year, you know? Thank you so much. The um the the Christ being born and then dying three months later was like almost like a, a call back to that, that other piece of yours that, that Unity read earlier. It was great. I loved it. Yeah, yeah, just a really fantastic piece. Thank you so much for reading, Blick. I think I actually... <laughs> I may have unmuted, I think I unmuted myself, muted myself, spoke, and then unmuted, anyway, <laughs> that was a beautiful piece, Blake, thank you so much for reading it, would anyone else like to read tonight, is what I think I said while I was muted. <laughs> I believe I saw David wanted to read. Oh, cool, yeah, David. Uh, yeah, um, it's not, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not my work, it's uh, the work of someone else, uh, it is, um, by this one uh, person by the name of Jim Daniels. I have the book here, it's called Punching Out, right here. Uh, it's a pretty cool uh, um, uh, poetry book of, uh, uh, I mean, hopefully, the, hopefully it's not too corny when I say it, but it's like really like working class kind of poetry. It's about like 
working in a factory and like dealing with the dehumanization and uh, the shit that you go through with that. Um, this was also written like in the midst of like, uh, uh, you know, like Reagan and his uh, absolutely uh, decimation of the American working class. Uh, and uh, it kind of has to do with kind of that stuff as well, so, um, in, in particular. Uh, and I wanted to read like uh, a particular section of it, which fortunately isn't terribly long, but it's also one of my favorite sections of the whole book. I think all, all four poems are just really, really good in it. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, this is from uh, Punching Out, and this section is uh, the little section, or chapter, whatever you want to call it, it's called The Village Idiot. <sighs> Ronald Evans and his stepson, Michael Nitz, both former auto workers, beat Vincent Chin to death with a baseball bat outside a Detroit nightclub. They apparently thought Chin was Japanese and blamed him for the, and blamed him for the industry's joblessness. Both received probation for manslaughter. This one is called Not Working. <clears throat> the city lights on the hill across the river from this concrete park are not winking at me. They're singing a song about briefcases and broken pianos. This night, a black limousine speeds past, drops a bundle of ticking stars in front of me. Messed up on cheap wine in the middle of all this business, I cough up a hawker, spit it into the river. The hand on my shoulder could be the soft weight of the night, could be an unfolding angry fist. It is the hand of no friend, of move on. Someone is always calling me away at such moments of clear vision with words like property and law. In the morning, I will join the line curling around the corner like a smashed snake, twitching a bit at the end. Yes, I will wait my turn like the rest of them, my fists unclenching like alarm clocks. I sit on the stoop of my father's house, allowing myself this luxury, untaxed and uninvited. I tug on my beard, hum and rock like the village idiot. I sit for a long time. I hum so quietly, not even the mailbox hears me. This next poem is called In Line. I stand in line with the rest of them, shuffle my feet on the floor, shifting my weight from foot to foot like a like a naked kid in line for a football physical. Nowhere to hide, eyes on the floor. I have no skills. That's what I will learn here today. This next poem is called Costs. I press my nose to the screen and wait for the dog. Dark sky tonight, the moon getting some time off too. I think of the numbers, how many cars America buys determines whether I work or not, whether I have money or not. My dog jingles as he trots around the corner and the music of his chain hits a warm spot. I crouch next to him. Our breath steams the air. He licks my face, glad to have me home. Maybe I buy his friendship with food. He's trained to accept the chain, to wait patiently while I hook and unhook it. I do not miss the noise and sweat. I may get called back soon, or I may not. I let the dog back into the house. They have lists. My bank account dwindles. I hang the chain on its hook. I search for more ways to save. And this last one is called Called Back. Driving down the same bumpy road, I fight to get my place back. I know the way, which lot to park in, which lane to turn down. I wish a fly out the window slamming into park. The same gray coveralls, same broken glass. Pass the guard, punch the card. New production number, new gloves, same old grease and dim lights. For lunch, I eat the same meat, the same stale bread. Friends are still friends, and assholes, assholes. The quarters I drop into the coffee machine sing a song I've me sing a song I've memorized despite my lack of faith. I fold my hands around the cup, thinking about how much I need this job. The first bitter sip. Those were beautiful. I, I'm gonna have to, I actually um, dug up a link to where the 
to the press where the collection, which I, as you said, is called Punching Out, where it can be bought. Yeah. And I'm going to have to check it out because there's so much. I love poetry <laughs> that is like so carefully controlled and restrained and yet communicates so much, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I happened upon that because uh, just like pure luck, uh, when I was still in university, uh, the like entire like uh, basically all the humanities departments, more or less, uh, were uh, moving to like a whole new building, and the uh, people there, like the professors and grad students and stuff, I, I think, who had offices there, they were just like uh, giving away. Uh, books for free that they just felt like giving away. And uh, th this book is one of the things that I managed to snag. Yeah, damn, damn. I actually uh, just put the link to the, uh, where you can buy the, the collection in the chat. So if anyone else wants to check it out and find it there. And I also tweeted it out. Um, uh, did anyone else? Have, thank you, thank you, David. Thank you so much for reading. Yeah. Um, did anyone else have anything they wanted to read tonight or are we ready to call it a night here? Um, well, no, I thought, I thought we were gonna talk after. Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> I always, I mean, call the reading a night. I'll always leave the, uh, the chat up for, I don't know, an hour or so after, you know. Uh, but did anyone, Rudy, did anyone put anything in the chat? I didn't see anything, but I always have a way of missing that. Uh, I didn't see anything, but if anybody wants to jump in, uh, just jump in. Okay, last call here, guys. <laughs> okay, if not, I'm going to leave, uh, as I said, I'll leave the Zoom chat up, but I'll stop recording in a minute here. Um, if you're watching this after the fact on YouTube, we do this every Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific. Misery Loves Company. Check us out on Twitter at miserytourism. Not at twitter.com. At Misery Tourism on Twitter. We tweet out the link about 15 minutes before the show starts. Um, and while I'm stumbling around, <laughs> garbling everything here, I did want to say before I stop recording, just remind everyone: A Rough Guide to Bear Creek, Stuart Buck's um, Bear Creek Gazette, Gazette collection is still up on Kickstarter. Um, I'll make sure I tweet out the link as well, but definitely Stu is doing amazing shit over at Bear Creek and, um, and he can pay it any, and he pays his authors too, which is spectacular. So yeah, anyway, that's that. Fuck it. We're done here for tonight.